Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Lisa Carlson? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoyed this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case, move to the timeline of the crime, and offer my analysis. Lisa Carlson was born in San Diego, California, on June 28, 1971. Her father was in the Army, so her family moved around quite a bit when she was young. Lisa settled in Tacoma, Washington, where she met a man named Daniel Carlson. They both worked in a retirement home. Lisa was a nurse's aide, and Daniel was a nurse. The couple dated for a year before getting married in 1994. They both accepted positions at a rehabilitation facility where Daniel's parents, Daryl and Carol, worked. In 1995, Daniel and Lisa had twin boys. Lisa stayed home to raise their sons, but this led to financial difficulties for the couple. They accumulated significant debt. In September 1997, the couple moved into a trailer on property owned by Daniel's parents. The property was located in Kapowson, Washington, a rural area about 30 miles south of Tacoma. Daniel's parents occupied another trailer that was just 450 feet from the trailer where Daniel and Lisa lived. The idea behind this move was that the couple would get more support. Daniel's parents could help babysit as Daniel tried to dig out of debt. The relationship between Daniel and Lisa was not stable. Lisa started having an affair with a former friend of Daniel's named Sean McKillop. She ended up spending most nights at Sean's residence. In November 1997, Sean prepared a separation agreement for the couple. This seems like an unusual arrangement. I guess Sean was offering a wide variety of services, including lover and separation agreement creator. Regardless of this distressing document drafting dilemma, the agreement stated that Lisa would care for the children while Daniel was working. His normal shift was 2.15 p.m. to 10.30 p.m. Lisa would arrive at the trailer before Daniel left for work and watch their two sons until he returned home at about 11 p.m. At this point, Lisa would typically leave and spend the night with her lover. Tension in the Carlson household was high, mostly because of the infidelity part. Daniel told his co-workers that his marriage was over and he hated Lisa because she was having an affair. In February 1998, Carol confronted Lisa and her lover, Sean, and addressed Lisa using unkind terms. Daryl arrived as the confrontation was going on and allegedly attacked Lisa and Sean. As a result, Lisa obtained a restraining order against Daryl. At this point, Daniel and Lisa were preparing for divorce. In preparation for these proceedings, Carol kept a journal with a list of Lisa's shortcomings like not caring for the children, and continuing to engage in infidelity. So Carol was clearly on the side of her son, Daniel. She was keeping this log to assist him. Daniel had growing concerns that, as a man in the state of Washington, he would almost certainly lose custody of his children. He was afraid that Lisa was going to take their sons out of state. His fears were well-founded. This is exactly what Lisa was planning on doing. At some point around this time, Daniel and Lisa filed for bankruptcy. In April 1998, Lisa told her father that she was planning on divorcing Daniel after the bankruptcy was finalized. Now moving to the timeline of the crime. On July 15, 1998, Lisa told Sean's stepsister that she wanted out of the marriage and intended to move away to Arizona with Sean. Apparently, Sean's father lived in Arizona. This, of course, was Daniel's worst fear. Lisa was going to take the children and move out of state. On July 17, Lisa told Sean's stepsister that Daniel was acting, quote, too weird and crazy, unquote, and that she needed to be free from the marriage. On July 18, 1998, Lisa arrived at her lover's residence sometime after midnight. She informed Sean that she was going to meet him in the afternoon and they could leave for Arizona with her children. It appears as though Lisa had made her decision. It was time to go. 
Lisa departed Sean's residence between 12.30 and 12.45 p.m. to go to the trailer, presumably to allow Daniel to go to work as usual. This trip typically took between 45 minutes and an hour, which meant that Lisa should have arrived at the trailer sometime between 1.15 p.m. and 1.45 p.m. Daniel arrived at work at 3 p.m., which meant he was running late. At 3.40 p.m., Lisa's computer was activated. Someone tried to open an internet browser that had recently been deleted, presumably to access Lisa's email. Lisa's mother called her at 6.20 p.m., and there was no answer. She left a message on Lisa's answering machine. At 8.04 p.m., Daniel's mother, Carol, paged him. When they spoke on the phone, Carol told Daniel that the twins had walked to her trailer. So they left Lisa's trailer and walked to Carol's trailer, again a distance of about 450 feet. There was a path through a wooded area that led from one trailer to the other. This event was concerning to Carol. She called Lisa several times, but there was no answer. She wanted Daniel to come home and check on Lisa. Daniel left work early. After arriving at the trailer, he discovered that Lisa was dead. She was on the couch with blood covering her head. Daniel called 911 at 8.59 p.m. The police arrived about 15 minutes later. Here's what they found during their investigation. Lisa Carlson had been shot three times, twice in the head and once in the upper chest. The weapon was a 22 caliber firearm, and three 22 caliber long rifle cartridge cases were found in the trailer. The first shot was to her head, and it would have rendered her incapable of voluntary movement. Her body was on the couch in the living room. Her head was on a pillow off to one side. The lower half of her body was covered in a blanket. Her sweatpants had been pulled down, and there was a sex toy on her right thigh. A wire connected the toy to a controller, which was found in her left hand. There was a handprint in blood on the toy. The television was on and connected to a video cassette recorder, otherwise known as a VCR. This is a device, which was popular in the 1980s and 1990s, that played magnetic tape cassettes. An adults-only videotape was found in the VCR, and the VCR had been paused. The remote to the VCR was not within reach of where Lisa's body was positioned. Based on the location of blood spatter, Lisa was shot while sitting upright in the middle of the couch, and her body was moved to the side of the couch where she was found. There was no evidence of forced entry into the trailer. The master bedroom and master bathroom of the trailer had been ransacked. Several drawers were pulled out. Nothing of value was missing from the trailer, including a TV, computer, a stereo, and jewelry. The police spoke to Daniel. He said that he left late for work because Lisa did not arrive at the trailer until 2.15 p.m. He departed five minutes after that. He returned to the trailer after being notified by his mother, Carol, about his sons walking to her residence. This is when he discovered Lisa's body. Daniel admitted that there were problems in the marriage. He and Lisa had not had sex in 18 months. He had been sleeping on the couch. Investigators confirm that Daniel arrived at work at 3 p.m. The police spoke to Carol. She said that Lisa's sons showed up at her trailer at 5.45 p.m. She left three messages on Lisa's answering machine before getting in contact with her son, Daniel. The police interviewed Lisa's lover, Sean, early the next day, July 19. He had an alibi, which the police were able to confirm. On July 22, the police executed a search warrant for Carol's trailer. They found the journal detailing all of Lisa's shortcomings. Again, this is the journal that was going to be used in the divorce proceedings. Investigators believe that Daniel and Carol were responsible for Lisa's murder, but it was not a straightforward case. Either one of them had time to commit the murder alone, so this didn't necessarily involve a conspiracy. The police determined that Lisa was probably killed between 1.15 p.m., which is the earliest that she could have arrived at the trailer, and 2.40 p.m., which is the latest that Daniel could have left the trailer. One theory the police had was that Daniel shot Lisa and Carol staged the crime scene. 
It took about three years for investigators to file charges. On July 20, 2001, Daniel and Carol were arrested and charged with first-degree murder. They were found guilty in April 2003 and sentenced to 37 years in prison. Daniel was 31 years old at this time, and his mother Carol was 51. In May 2006, their convictions were overturned because the police botched the investigation. They executed a search warrant for a gun on Carol's trailer, yet they seized a journal. It's not clear how the police could confuse these two items. It sounds like they just went in with notebooks blazing, hoping to charge somebody with possession of a deadly diary. In addition to the poor investigation, hearsay was permitted during the trial. The state planned on trying the case again, but Daniel and Carol entered plea agreements before that happened. Daniel pleaded guilty to second-degree murder and was sentenced to 23 years in prison. He was scheduled for release in 2022. Therefore, presumably, he is out of prison at the time making this video. Carol pleaded guilty to three counts of second-degree assault and one offense related to sex. She was sentenced to nine years in prison. She was released in 2008 after serving seven years total. Now moving to my analysis. Many people have been critical of the state of Washington for offering a plea bargain in this case. They believe the strength of the case against Daniel and Carol was powerful, even without the journal being admitted into evidence. Was the state's case really that strong? Let's take a look at the evidence both for and against the idea that Daniel and Carol were guilty of murder, starting with the inculpatory factors. Daniel and Lisa had a tumultuous relationship. Lisa was having an affair and spending most nights with her lover as Daniel took care of their sons. On the day of the murder, Daniel claimed that Lisa arrived later than she should have based on when she left her lover's residence. He called his employer to tell them he was running late. Carol called her sister to cancel plans for that afternoon. So both Daniel and Carol had an anomaly in their schedule. Someone attempted to open a deleted internet browser on Lisa's computer. Why would Lisa have done this? She knew the browser had been deleted. A message that Lisa's mother left on Lisa's answering machine had been deleted. There was an irregularity between Carol's first and second message on the answering machine that could only be achieved by removing the tape and rewinding it in another machine. Carol owned a machine that could produce this irregularity. After the police responded to Daniel's 911 call, he repeatedly told them that they needed to examine the answering machine, as if he knew it contained exculpatory evidence, or he believed it contained exculpatory evidence. Carol offered three different excuses about why she did not go down to the trailer after Lisa's sons arrived. One, the boys told her that Lisa was sleeping, and Carol did not want to disturb Lisa. This is curious considering Carol's messages contained words like, wake up. Two, there was a restraining order against Carol. In reality, it was against her husband, Daryl. And three, Carol wanted to teach Lisa a lesson about watching the children. Daniel told the police that he purchased a 22 caliber semi-automatic pistol seven months before the murder. He traded the pistol for 9mm ammunition at a gun show. The police could not find a record of either the purchase or the trade. Daniel asked an employee at the medical examiner's office how Lisa's death certificate could be altered to indicate that she died while he was at work. The remote for the VCR was outside of Lisa's reach. The VCR had been paused mid-tape, but if it was playing when Lisa was killed, it would have continued to play to the end. It's not like the VCR would stop itself after hearing the gunshots and say, is everything okay? Should I continue? The homicide automatic stopping feature didn't come along until later. There was a handprint in blood on the sex toy. It could not have been from Lisa because she would have been rendered incapable of voluntary movement after the first shot. Daniel was concerned about Lisa taking the children away. Carol told a coworker that she was never going to let Lisa take the children away from her. The bankruptcy, which would have freed Lisa, was finalized three days after the murder. Moving to the exculpatory factors, on the day of the murder, a neighbor spotted an unfamiliar white vehicle driving toward Lisa's trailer. This vehicle has never been identified. Perhaps the killer was driving it. There were no witnesses to the murder. 
The murder weapon was never recovered. There was no physical evidence connecting Daniel or Carol to the murder. Lisa's infidelity could have given other people a motive to kill her. Any perpetrator could have staged the scene to make it look like either Daniel or Carol were responsible. It makes sense that another killer would want to frame someone else for the murder. Either Daniel or Carol could have been the killer by themselves. They were not necessarily conspirators. Maybe one of them was guilty, but the other one was not guilty. When considering all the evidence, do I think the case against Daniel and Carol was strong? I don't think the state had that good a case, mostly because either Daniel or Carol could have been the killer. Another possibility is that Daniel committed the murder and Carol was an accessory after the fact. So she didn't take part in the actual murder, rather she just helped to stage the scene. I think the state made a good decision by offering Daniel and Carol the plea bargains. A conviction was definitely not guaranteed at retrial. The state was in a challenging position. It probably felt as though someone was holding a journal to their head. Moving to my last question, what do I think happened in this case? This is just a theory, my opinion. Daniel was described as an awkward and quiet individual who was not romantically experienced when he met Lisa. Both Daniel and Lisa were terrible with money, which motivated them to move into the trailer. As Daniel was working and trying to make ends meet, Lisa started having an affair with his childhood friend. Lisa had low self-esteem, was excitement-seeking, and did not care about her family. She was acting recklessly. Daniel grew resentful because not only was Lisa having an affair, but she was spending most nights with her lover and leaving her sons in the trailer. Lisa refused to discontinue her infidelity. She was lost in a fantasy world where she was going to run off with her lover and have this amazing life. In addition, she was planning on taking her sons out of state, despite the legal problems this might create for her. This placed Daniel under even more stress. Not only was he going bankrupt and losing his wife, but he was going to lose his sons as well. Daniel's level of empathy was low enough to facilitate murder, and Lisa's level of empathy was low enough to miss the warning signs that Daniel was dangerous. On July 18, 1998, Lisa told Daniel about her plan to leave. In the heat of the moment, he produced a 22 caliber pistol and shot her to death. He then contacted his mother and told her what happened. She tried to fabricate evidence to confuse the time of death. Despite it placing Carol at more risk for being caught, she introduced the toy into the staging effort to humiliate Lisa. Carol was disgusted by Lisa's infidelity and wanted Lisa to forever be remembered as someone who only sought to satisfy her own desires. The incompetence of the police and the unlikely mother-son conspiracy put the state in a tough position, which prompted the plea deal and added one more insult to Lisa's legacy. Those are my thoughts on the case of Lisa Carlson. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.